name is Dave Morrow. Nine months of each year, I live out of my vehicle. I travel the wilderness by foot on an endless backpacking and landscape photography trip. I want to teach and share the photography and outdoor skills that I use on these trips. I don't want to spend hours editing video or sitting in front of a computer, so I made some rules. First, everything shot on GoPro. This was the best way I found to record quickly on a consistent basis. Second, I can only spend 20 minutes editing each video. So thanks for watching, and welcome to the Landscape Photography Journals. So I'm hiking up one of the large rivers and the Cascades of Washington State. And I've been on the trail for about 15 miles. Got my whitewater pack raft packed in my bag. Got my helmet and my paddles. But the plan is to hike up to close to the source of this river. And then I'm gonna take this raft down the river back to where my camp spot is. And I find that it gives me a really good way to get different angles and views of different landscapes that I couldn't get by just staying on the trail. It also allows me to scout for different areas or different hikes that I might want to do from the river view because you can get a lot of different angles at specific parts of the wilderness that you're traveling through. So I'm just going to take you guys on a short pack raft adventure with me. Get up here, get my raft blown up, show you how it works, and head on down the river. to test different ISO settings today and see their performance in a really high dynamic range scene. So I'm right next to the river right now, but the sun is, here I'll show you, peeking through right there. So there's a really large contrast between the sunlight and then these huge trees right here. So my goal is to take a shot right into this high contrasted scene and test the different ISO values of my camera. So I'm gonna leave the f-stop the same and the exposure the same. I'm gonna shoot in aperture priority mode so the exposure will just hold constant no matter what. Then I'll start at my lowest ISO value and then just increase, increase, increase until I'm at the highest ISO value. Then I can look at all those different shots in Adobe Camera Raw and I'll determine the maximum and minimum usable ISO values of my camera. They don't ever have to guess when I'm out shooting in the field. All right, so before I actually show you how to do this test in the field, I want to explain what it's all about so it'll make sense. So anytime that I get a new camera, one of the first few things I do is test the dynamic range of that camera, and then I also test the usable ISO of that camera. So to test the dynamic range, I use either ISO 64 or 100, and I take a shot into direct sunlight, exposing for the highlights only so the rest of the image is very dark and underexposed. After I do that, I go to the darkest part of the image, such as down here, and then I'll just drag this exposure slider up, and I'll see how far I can pull it over to the right before I start to get a lot of noise, grain, and discoloration in the image. And you can see that I can pull this around 3.5 five to four before it starts getting a lot of noise and discoloration in this part of the image. If I go to the other parts of the image, such as back here, you can see that I'm also starting to get some noise and discoloration back here. So the goal is not to use this and pull out all the dark details all the time. It's just to know in the worst case scenarios, when you have to do it, how much dark detail you can pull out of the shadows of the image. Now it's always much better to take 
one exposure for the highlights, such as this shot, and then take another exposure which is brighter for the shadows. But in the worst case scenario, it's great to know how much dark detail you could pull out of these shadows if you only had a single exposure to get off in that instance. So in the second test, I'm going to take shots at all the different ISO values on my camera. And then I want to find out the maximum usable ISO value, which I can shoot at without getting too much discoloration, noise, and degradation in image quality. Now the reason for this is that at times I need to max out my ISO when I'm in low light shooting scenarios and I've already maxed out my shutter speed and f-stop values. I want to know how high I can go in ISO and still salvage the final image. So this is a very important test. So let's jump back to the field. I'll show you how I take these shots and then we will jump back onto the computer and I'll go through how I analyze them. So for this shot, I don't really care about the composition. I just wanted very dark parts, very light, light parts. I've already focused and I'm exposing just for the highlights. So I can see how the different ISO values perform in these shadow details. So my camera is a Nikon D810 and it has a native or base ISO of 64. So I'm gonna test the lowest values first, which is L1. And I believe that is about ISO 25. So I'll just take the shot there. And since this is the first shot of the series, I'll make sure that nothing is too badly blown out. It looks good. And I'll also check the focus. And that's sharp enough for this test. So now that I know that the focus is good and the exposure is good, I can just continue to increase the ISO. So now I'll go to ISO 64, take a shot there. From 64, I'll go to 100. I'll take a shot there. And now I'm just going to start increasing by one stop increment. So I'll go 100, 200, 400, and so on and so forth. All right, so here are the first two image files. And we're gonna do the dynamic range test first. We'll look at a bunch of different parts of the image. So the actual files and the actual camera that I'm using are arbitrary. You can do these exact same test analysis using your camera. The results will differ, but the process is the same. So the reason that I chose these two is because my Nikon D810 has a base or standard ISO of 64, but usually I shoot at ISO 100 because I feel that it has almost exactly the same image quality with nearly zero degradation in the final image, but it's two thirds of a stop faster. So I like to shoot at it much more because I can get images off a lot quicker and I don't see any movement in parts of the landscape such as leaves, trees, and other things like that. So first we'll look at the dynamic range of the ISO 64 image. And if you guys want to learn about the technical details of ISO, how it works, and everything else that has to do with it, I have a free PDF that goes into all the science of ISO and how I select the specific ISO settings for every different shooting scenario. So you can download that below and I'll also link it up in the top of the page. So let's check out ISO 64 first. And this is just Lightroom develop module. So I'm gonna look down here in the dark areas, such as right here. And I'm just gonna grab the exposure slider and I'm gonna pull it right. And you can see that even though that was completely black, I can pull a lot of dark detail out of it. And there's hardly any noise at all in this image. Now there's a little bit of color degradation. This is a little bit more magenta than the actual tree would have been. So that's one issue with it. We can look through the rest of the parts of the image, such as down in these leaves. You can see that they do have a little tint of magenta down there. If I darken it down, you can't see that too much. But I would say that I could pull about 0.35 stops of light out of this image and still use it. Now the results are not gonna be quite as good as if I took a second exposure, which was much brighter to capture all of this dark detail. We can look back in these leaves and the trees. The greens aren't quite as nice as they would have been if I would have properly exposed for this part of the image. If I look back in this area, you can see that the greens are a little bit washed out. They're not quite as nice and saturated as they would have been. But it's a pretty good image considering the actual exposure was just for these highlights and leaves, but I could pull out all of this dark detail down here. So my entire goal of this is that when I'm out shooting, 
if I only have the chance to get one single exposure off of a specific scene, I know that if I get it within plus 3.5 stops, even though it won't be quite as good image quality, I can still salvage the image and use it in my portfolio without any problem at all. So that works very well for testing that out. Now I never have to guess out in the field, and I actually know the maxes and mins of the dynamic range for my specific camera. So we gave a look at that shot. Let's grab the ISO 100 shot now. So same exact composition. The only thing that changed here was moving from ISO 64 to ISO 100. The exposure was exactly the same. Jump in the develop module. And I'm going to start looking at the same place first, this tree. I'm going to pull this right. And you can see that there's a little bit of image degradation, a little bit of noise, and a little bit of color degradation as well in the magenta of that tree. Look down here as well. And it looks very close to the same as the ISO 64. So I'd say I can pull about 3.5 out of this one as well. And they should perform almost exactly the same. It's almost exactly the same image quality. And I can see the same attributes are going on up here. A little bit of washout in the bright colors such as green and yellow. But overall not too bad of degradation. So if we zoom in at 100% right here, and then I jump over to the ISO 64 image and do the same. Let's see if I can jump back and forth here and do a comparison. So this is the ISO 100 image and this is the ISO 64 image. Jump back and forth once more. You can see slightly more noise, just a little bit grainy on the ISO 100 image. Or if I go to the 64 there's not quite as much noise or grain in that area. But this is zoomed in at 100%. So I would say that the ISO 100 image is about 98% as good as the ISO 64 image. But oftentimes I'm not really looking at the very pixel level of these images. I don't print them big. I don't even sell prints. So I'm not necessarily worried about any noise in there if it's very minimal like this. I'm only worried about getting the best shots from my image portfolio, which I display online. So it's all a special use case if you really want to pixel peep and determine if that little bit amount of noise matters for you. So this is the reason that I choose to shoot at ISO 100 instead of ISO 64. It just gives me two thirds of a stop faster f-stop or shutter speed in return for that barely little bit of image quality degradation, which you saw right there. And I don't find it to show up at all when I put these on my online portfolio. I don't even think that would show up noticeable to your eye on a large print. So this next test, I'm going to look at all of my different ISO values and determine the maximum usable ISO value, which I can actually use in the field. Now this doesn't mean that I'd want to shoot at this maximum usable ISO value all the time. It's for the worst case situations and shooting scenarios where I've already maxed out my f-stop and then I've maxed out my shutter speed, but I still need to either make the shutter speed faster or increase the f-stop to provide a larger depth of field. To maintain the same image brightness or exposure, the only way to do that would be to balance them with increasing the ISO. So I want to know that maximum usable ISO without having to guess. So here's the 32 image. Then if we go to 64, I'll zoom in here so we can look at pixel peeped part of the image. So this is the 32 ISO. Next is 64. Next is 100. And if we look at the difference between the ISO 64 and 100, and we zoom in here on these trees and leaves, you can see that the ISO 100 is a little bit sharper because the shutter speed was two thirds of a stop faster and these leaves were moving around. So if I go from 64, you can't really see the defined edges of these. But if I go to 100, you can see there's much sharper edges around the edge of these leaves. And that's just because of two thirds of a stop faster shutter speed. And you can also tell that there's not really much change in image quality. There's slightly more noise in the ISO 100, but if we weren't zoomed in at 10,000%, I wouldn't really notice that. So I don't really mind it shooting at ISO 100. And that's the reason why I do it. Next, we can go to 200. Slightly more noise here. A little bit of noise here as well. Some is here as well. And a little bit of magenta tint to the image. 
You'll often see that magenta tint coming into the image as you increase the ISO values. 400, a lot more noise. 800, starting to get really noisy, especially over here in these dark details. If I go up to 1600, extreme noise. And if I go throughout the rest of the image, you can see that there's kind of a magenta tint here, really losing the nice color and the greens back here. Can't tell too much in the highlights. Highlights don't ever show noise or image degradation as much as the shadows. So when you're doing this test, always check the shadows out first. You can see a lot of magenta tint down here. If I go up to 3200, clearly I can't use that image. So I would say that if I went through these, 1600 is not very good. 800 is the maximum usable ISO that I can use on this camera. If I go down here to the darks, it's still salvageable. It's not anywhere near as good as the ISO 100 or 32. But if I had to max my camera out, such as low light scenarios or having to increase f-stop while still needing to maintain the same image brightness, then I could increase my ISO all the way up to 800. Now, if you don't understand the exposure triangle, this might seem quite confusing at first. So I've actually written a complete in-depth guide on f-stop value, ISO, and shutter speed. And it's a complete exposure triangle photography guide. And you can also get a free download of a PDF of that guide on the same page as the guide. Then you can take my exposure triangle guide out in the field with you and actually follow the step-by-step -step sequence I use to select the correct settings. So if you don't understand this stuff yet, that's okay. Just check out that exposure triangle guide, which I will link below this video. So my main goal for this video is to show you guys how to experiment and test with your own camera equipment so you don't have to trust what other people say as far as the correct or best camera settings. You shouldn't trust anything that I'm telling you here, and that's why I want to show you this framework so you can actually go out and test it on your own in the field and prove to yourself what actually works for your specific camera and lens setup. So I want to show you guys how to experiment and then you can run the experiments on your own and we can all find out what the best camera settings and continue to learn using that process. So thanks for watching this week's video guys. I will see you back here next Tuesday for the next video. Bye. Probably have maybe another two or three miles to get down to camp. And then I'll get there and make a bunch of good food because all my food's packed down in here because I'm a moron.